If you don't know what the words Wi-Fi and VOLP mean, don't feel too bad. Wi-Fi apparently stands for Wireless Fidelity and VOLP stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol. Now, here's the part that'll probably make you feel like a techno-Luddite. There are likely thousands of kids in Indonesia who do know what those things are. And they know because of my next guest. Dr. Ono Purbo has been described as a tech rebel and a man on a mission. And that mission, in his words, is to promote the dissemination of knowledge through information and communication technologies. And Dr. Purbo joins me in the studio. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. You've been working with, uh, with groups, and I, I was looking at some of the stuff on the IDRC website, because mm. you were doing stuff with them, and there's this picture there. <laughs> this is the thing that caught my attention. Ono demonstrates the creation of a Pringles can Wi-Fi antenna in South Africa. That would be a potato chip can, I'm thinking. Exactly. Potato okay. chip, yeah. All right. Wireless fidelity. Explain mm. this technology and explain how you're getting people to use it. In simple, yes. plain language. Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> it's basically, we use uh, wireless fidelity is basically internet over radio. Mm -hmm. So we use that for bypassing uh, the uh, telco infrastructure. Okay. So basically, we built our own infrastructure for okay. internet. Internet over the radio? Over the radio. Okay. So uh, we don't have to rely on telco service anymore mm -hmm. for broadband internet access. Okay. Having the internet 24-hour connections using this radio, yes. then we can set up uh, internet telephony over okay. the internet infrastructure. That's the uh, voice oh, okay. over IP. I see. Okay. All right. So that means we have we can have a uh, telephone over our 24-hour internet access. Okay. So th the internet access then do you still I mean if you're doing it over radio you still mm. need the a internet monitor? surface uh, uh, yeah internet surface provider. So we are okay. connected to the internet surface provider, okay. and the internet surface provider can use satellite. Okay. Or fiber optics. Yes. So. Why is why isn't everybody using this? <laughs> My first question. I mean, it seems yeah. to be seems to be a lot better than the current system. Oh uh, yeah, it's it's actually cheaper. Yeah, uh, it's easy to use because the technology is new. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper, easy to use. The major uh, problem with us is actually regulation. Okay, uh, we need to get a license to use the frequencies. Oh right. So right now uh, we we're still struggling uh -huh. to make the licensing process easier for us. Okay, is there not a problem though in if you're using radio you're using radio frequency frequencies mm. to access the internet, mm. but there are li a limited number of radio frequencies available, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. To give you some idea, in North America, in Canada, in yeah. US, in most of the European countries, you don't have, any, you don't need any license to use the frequencies if you use the uh, low power radio. Right. This is low power radio. Okay. So you don't need to use a uh, license. Okay. In Indonesia, in many uh, developing countries. We require a license. Oh, I see. Okay. So that's actually our major drawback. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, tell me about the Indo Indonesian project and the people, the kids you're working with there. I mean, mm. what what use is all of this being put to? Okay. The, the big ideas. Uh, we like to see the Indonesian people to be able to survive using their brain. Mm -hmm. So that's the major big ideas. Okay. This knowledge-based society, basically. Okay. And we realize that internet is like the tool. To be able to enable the people to be able to, to, be able to uh, transfer the knowledge efficiently, okay. information efficiently, but we don't have any money. So the the trick is we we many of us educate the people how to build the infrastructure themselves because it's 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 not that expensive. Mm -hmm. They what they don't have is the knowledge. So we provide the knowledge to them, and they invest their own money into the infrastructure, and they build the infrastructure that way. It's not a project, actually. Yeah. It's a movement within the society. OK, well, now, th now that's the distinction that I wanted to talk about, too, because when I was reading all of this stuff about you, mm. that's the word that keeps coming up, that it's a movement. movement. Yeah. How so? It's not funded by the uh, government. Mm -hmm. It's not funded by the World Bank. It's not funded by the, funded by the IMF. So we provide the knowledge to the people, the people convince it's a good idea to have in, uh, information infrastructure, yeah. and the equipment is not that expensive, and it's graphical user interface, so it's easy to to set up the thing. Mm -hmm. Just click, 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 click. That's it, and then they invest their own money into the infrastructure. It's yeah. many people doing these things. Now, so you're talking. I, I have to assume here that in in a number of cases, you're talking to people who haven't had any experience with mm -hmm. any of this stuff before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's that, it's that easy to grasp? It's, it's more difficult for 
I'm sorry, for the older generation. Okay, well, that's what, <laughs> why am I not surprised? Yeah. <laughs> but for, uh, so that's why our main, uh, our initial approach would be the school network. Okay. So we connect the school to the internet. Today we have 5,000 schools, Indonesian schools on the internet. We have 25,000 schools more. So it's a long way to go, yeah. but at least. But still. Still, like yeah. we have 5,000, mostly self finance financed by the student. Okay. Really? Eh? Yeah. It will cost them only 50 US cents per month per student to build this thing. This thing. So they invest basically their own money okay. to build the infrastructure. During the installation process, they learn how to set up this thing. They get the knowledge from us, like we publish books, yeah. and we also put the uh, book on the web so mm -hmm. people, people learn how to set up this, mm -hmm. these things. So basically, we educate the, the students. They build their own infrastructure. Having the infrastructure, it's opened their mind to more like the, uh, the pool of knowledge on the internet. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's like dropping a, a, a stone into a pond, right? You yeah. have that ripple effect. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then the student, having the student exposed to the uh, knowledge, then they influence their parents, they influence their neighbor, they influence the community. Yeah. Um, have you seen beneficial effects uh, out of all of this from in, in Indonesia from these kids in these schools that you've worked with? Uh, I give, well, I give you the example. Okay. Okay. Uh, some of us, this is not student, this is street children. Okay. We have been trying to help the street children for the last uh, two years. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and we're talking about kids living on the street what age? Uh, some of primary school, yeah, some okay. in uh, early high school. Okay. So that's that's the All age right. they are looking. Uh, we are looking at All right. the high school ones. Okay, the, the primary school ones now they can uh, use the computer. Basically, they can uh, draw things on the computer. Mm -hmm. But the most interesting one is the high school uh, kids. Within these two years, after these two years, they really like to play with the computer. Now they can install the uh, local area network. Now they can install the server. They can install the equipment themselves. And then uh, having the knowledge, some people hired, um, hired these kids to, to like a maintenance. OK, staff. really? Yeah. So, they, so they went from street kids to, to kids with jobs? Exactly. That must make you feel pretty good. It's many of us, actually. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. So what's the plan for this? Um, uh, I mean, obviously, you've done, you're doing the Indonesia thing. Mm. This picture is you in South Africa. Mm. I mean, this is, you're, this is all this over is, the place This now. is the IDRC part, yeah. coming to pictures. Yes. OK, so we have this experience. This is long-term experience. This, this is like 10 years experience you are talking about. Yes. This is not one, two months. This is 10 years experience. And having this experience, IDRC provide a sabbatical award to me. Yes. And then having the sabbatical award, they asked me to write, pro, uh, write the knowledge in English. Okay. So we can spread the knowledge to other countries, okay. to the Asia Pacific, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Africa, and South Af America as well. Okay. We put the knowledge on the web, actually. Yes. Uh, and also, they are, we are trying to publish this as a paper book. Okay. Yeah. Right. So people don't have access to the web; they can still read the uh, book. Right. Okay. So that's one part. The second part is IDRC also provide the funding to run workshop in many countries to initiate the, like the leaders in these countries okay. to uh, spread this kind of movement yeah. in, in this country, Hopeful, hoping that then we can have many knowledge based society in many countries, yeah. in developing countries. Yeah. The, the, uh, you, you seem to be very excited about this. Yes, yeah? yes, yes. This is a, this, you could, because why well, you see tangible results from it, I guess, eh? That's part of what makes us so excited? Uh, also from the religion, actually. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How well, so? Tell me about that. In simple words, yes. uh, one value, a person, the value of the person, is highly depend on the benefit of the person to the society. That's it. It's not the uh, money, it's not the uh, knowledge, mm -hmm. it's the benefit to the society. As, as many people get the benefit from the person, that's how, okay. yeah. All right. And you're going to be, you're, how far into this, the sabbatical are you now? 
uh, actually close to the end. <laughs> close to the end. <laughs> but <laughs> but still, uh, yeah. uh, I've been talking with them, so maybe we have something yeah. after. Yeah. It, I mean, it quite obviously has caught on. Right? Yeah. There's a great deal of interest yes, out there. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. When you go, let me just ask you finally then, and this is just sort of a logistical question, but when you go into a new area, mm -hmm. um, does it take a while for you to convince people that what you're telling them can actually happen? I think that people would initially be kind of exactly. skeptical about it. Yeah. yeah, it takes years. It takes years. It takes years. Yeah. It's not the <laughs> instant yeah. process. Like, Here we are. No, no, now no, build your computer. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. That's why I normally, uh, there are two things normally, mm -hmm. I, uh, two things. But was basically capacity building. Okay. Basically capacity building. So I train the uh, technician. Hopefully, some of the technician becoming the, uh, like the author for books okay. and articles in local, their local in language. In their local area. Okay, yeah, yeah, right. Local language. Okay. Yeah. So they can spread the knowledge to the uh, locals. And then the uh, next thing, what I normally uh, suggest is building the uh, network for schools because that's how we build the uh, mass yes. for the next generation. Yes. Yeah. And the school, the uh, having the, the knowledge, uh, uh, providing the uh, internet access to schools it takes only like 50 cents US yes, per know, student per amazing. month. Yes, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And we get the return of investment within two years. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you do. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, listen, congratulations on it. This says, sounds very exciting, and I'm really Thank glad you. you came in and tell Thank us about you. it. Good luck with the rest of it. I hope you get the, your, your uh, sabbatical extended and get to do more of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I hope many people get the uh, yeah. sabbatical as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank in. you very okay. much. Yeah. <laughs> We spent a lot of time on this program talking about the state of health care in Canada, the costs, the failures, the problems, the fact that it seems that uh, it's getting more and more difficult to entice people into the medical professions, doctors and nurses and so on. Here's what I mean. These are figures uh, released by the Canadian Nurses Association for 2002. They are the latest figures that are available. They show that just over 90% of the number of registered nurses in Canada are actually working in nursing. And the average age of those nurses is around mid 40s. So it seems as if there aren't enough real paying jobs for the nurses that are available and that not many young people seem to be going into the profession of nursing. Well, my next guest has put a personal face on the nursing profession in this country. Tilda Shaloff is a critical care nurse who works in an intensive care unit here in Canada. She's authored this book, A Nurse's Story, Life and Death and In Between in an Intensive Care Unit. And she joins me in the studio. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. I was really interested in this because, uh, like everybody else, I have a you know morbid fear of hospitals. And, <laughs> and, and, and you talk about that sort of thing, actually, in a great deal, in a great deal of detail in this book. But I was really intrigued uh, when you talked about going into this profession and getting into the ICU and and the things that you had to the things that you had to learn the 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 processes and the and the frame of mind and everything that it took to function in that environment as a professional mm -hmm. just I found astonishing and it took you a while to get used to it didn't it it certainly did uh, particularly the, the ICU the intensive care mm -hmm. unit it's a place of a great deal of technology, there's a lot of machinery, there's high tech, uh, everything yeah. is, um, uh, and, and it was quite an, a bombardment for me of all the different sounds and sights and the patients being as sick as they are, and you can imagine what a bombardment yeah. it is for families whose loved one is Absolutely. there. Absolutely. I try to always keep that in mind, even yeah. now, when I, after 20 years of doing it. When you first got into it, though, did, were there, uh, I know there were moments when you doubted that you could actually pull it off, right? Yes. Yeah. What, what, did you just think you wouldn't, wouldn't be able to, to manage the, the the, the emotional part of it or the physical part of it? What, what were the things that... Well, I just didn't have a lot of confidence when I was young. I guess I, I speak wrote about my personal life a little bit in the mm -hmm. book of why I went into nursing. And uh, it was the overwhelming responsibilities that I had and, um, and, and that I still have. But yeah. today I feel very confident in handling them. But there were huge responsibilities. I mean, people's lives are literally in my hands. Yeah. And I did not always feel up to the challenge in the early days. But I had colleagues who helped me along the way. And uh, that's how I got yeah. through it. And you I, were referred to by one colleague early on as perhaps being too sensitive. Yes, right? that colleague continues to yes. berate me for that <laughs> epithet. And, yes. and, but she happens to be very sensitive herself. Yeah. But you know, she, everyone shows it in a different way. And yeah. I'm very open with my emotions and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be that way. And everyone's different. Um, let's talk about that because you, you do talk at length in the book too about that, uh, that balance that has to be achieved. Do you have a conversation in the book that you put in between yourself and, and one of your superiors? This is during a period of time when, when they were she was actually asking you if you were going to go back to school for mm. reasons because they didn't want to have to lay anybody off. We can talk about that too. But, mm -hmm. but she also talked to you about um, 
getting getting that balance that that certain certain patient emotions are infectious like yes. anxiety and so on now that had never until i read that it never occurred to me that the feelings being experienced by the patient and the patient's family and everything could sort of lap over onto the doctors and nurses around them. But it does, mm -hmm. doesn't it? It does, and try as hard as you might, uh, it, it does affect one very much. I remember just last week I was taking care of a patient and uh, he had been a minor and he ex had um, claustrophobia and he was in the ICU for mm -hmm. other reasons altogether, reasons having to do with, it doesn't matter yeah. right now. And he uh, suffered from claustrophobia and he was so agitated, he was trying to climb out of bed. And he, and as the day wore on, and I tried everything I could to comfort him um, and to calm him down and I had to use some sedation and that didn't work and I gave him more sedation and the family came in and, and as the day wore on, he was getting more and more agitated. I was afraid he was gonna hurt himself mm -hmm. and and his heart rate was going fast and, and all of a sudden, you know, I realized I was getting agitated yes. too and here I am after all these years and still it affects me. And just at that moment, my co two colleagues came into the room, and Julia and, and, uh, and I just remember it so well, they just yeah. and Leslie, they just walked right into the room at that moment and nurses do have an incredible intuition and uh, they, just, they just took over for me, said go take a break. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an example of how that, yeah. you know, you, you try as hard as you might, it's not always possible. Do you recognize that in your colleagues too, in other nurses? Like when they... The intuition? They, yeah, well, when, when, yeah, do you have this sense about them that when they've reached a point at certain I stages? I hope I'm as sensitive yeah. to them and as helpful yeah. to them as they are to me. I try to be a team player. Yeah. The, the, um, there are a number of anecdotes in the book, uh, some very sweet ones too, and there's one that I wanted to tell, it's a very brief one about an elderly woman who was, you were moving in a wheelchair, I guess, back to her room, I'm not sure, well, she was yes. going to get her to the hospital, she had a quarter, mm -hmm. she wanted to make a, a phone call. Yeah, and it was a little unwieldy, I had the bed, I was pushing the bed with a porter, he was helping mm -hmm. me, we had to get her up to her room, she had done very well in the ICU, so she had this quarter and she wanted to make a phone call, so I wheeled her up to the pay phone, and uh, she put a, the quarter in, and she asked me to dial a certain number, and I did, and she <laughs> just said,